Hey guys, my name is Richard. I serve as the lead pastor here at Restoration House. I'm gonna walk you through our Connect course. Thank you guys so much uh, for watching this online. Um, you could be anywhere right now. One of the good things to do about uh, being anywhere is you can grab your Bible wherever you're at and let's focus in on what we're gonna be going through. The goal of the Connect course is simply this, to help you strengthen your relationship with Jesus Christ and to introduce you to Restoration House. On behalf of all of our team, our staff, all of our members, we just want to say welcome to Restoration House. We're going to begin uh, with really the most important part of any church experience is we're going to talk about the gospel. We're going to break this down in a really cool and hopefully memorable way for you. So we're going to start off from the very, very beginning. In the beginning, God created us in his image for a purpose. In Genesis chapter 1, verses 26 through 28, it says, Then God said, Let us make man in our image, after our likeness. So God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him. Male and female, he created them. God blessed them. And God said, uh, be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth and subdue it. So the first thing is God created us in his image for a purpose. And he also, he wanted a relationship with us. In Genesis chapter 2, it says, The Lord God planted a garden in Eden. In the east, there he put the man whom he had formed, the man and the woman heard the sound of the Lord walking in the garden in the cool of the day. Third thing is, he wanted to give us abundant life. It says in Genesis chapter 2, starting in verse 9, that the tree of life was in the midst of the garden and the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. And the Lord God commanded the man, saying, You may surely eat of every tree in the garden, but of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, you shall not eat of it. For in the day that you eat of it, you will surely die. That's some bad news. That is known as the fall of man. We're going to read in Genesis chapter 3. This is the rebellion. Everything was good until it was not good. And this is what we see. It says that the serpent said to the woman, Did God actually say, You shall not eat of any tree of the garden? And the woman said to the serpent, You may eat of the tree and the fruit of the garden, but God said, You shall not eat of the tree that is in the midst of the garden, neither shall you touch it, lest you die. But the serpent said to the woman, you will not surely die, uh-oh, for God knows that when you eat of it, your eyes will be open and you will be like God. Well, we know that the serpent was trying to trick the woman who ended up falling and eating the, the fruit and she gave to her husband and then he ate it. And when the first humans disobeyed God, sin entered into the world. The ensuing catastrophe affected every aspect of our lives. Humanity lost access to God's immortal gift of life, and we became subject to death. The earth became cursed. Our relationships with one another became estranged. Our relationship to the Creator became ruptured, and our relationship with God was broken off. And in the aftermath of this initial rebellion, sin flooded into our world. Ha! Huh, horrible, huh? Well, in Romans chapter 6, verse 23, the Bible says, For the wages of sin is death. Now this, my friend, is the bad news. When the first humans disobeyed God, they rejected His authority, they doubted His truthfulness, and they questioned His goodness. And because of this sin that came into the world, there is this vast separation between God and man. It's like God is up here and man is down here. And in Isaiah 59 verse 2, 
It says it like this. Your iniquities have made a separation between you and your God. Your sin have hidden his face from you so that he does not hear. That's where we are as humans. In Isaiah 64, verse 6, it says it like this. We have all become like one who is unclean. All of our righteous deeds are like a polluted garment. One version says it's like a filthy rag. And sadly, so many people have difficulty seeing this separation. It's almost like if you've ever tried to pray and you felt like your prayers didn't get above the ceiling, it's like you can almost feel the distance between you and God. But there is good news. This is what it's all about. The good news is that God has a godly solution. He has a divine plan. Because God is holy, righteous, and just, He would not sit back and allow sin to go unpunished. Yet, but because He loves us, He did not want mankind to be eternally separated from Him. God became man in Jesus Christ. Amen to that. He lived the life that we should have lived. He died the death that we should have died. Three days later, he rose from the dead, proving that he is the Son of God and offers the gift of salvation for all who repent and believe the gospel. This is the good news. This is the the gospel. And we're going to break down the gospel so you can understand what it means bit by bit. The first part is that God became man in Jesus Christ. In John chapter 1, verse 1, and then in verse 14, it says, In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. And the Word became flesh and dwelt among us. And we have seen his glory, the glory as of the only Son from the Father, Father, full of grace and truth. And we see in verse 14 that that word became flesh. Next part is he lived the life that we should have lived. In 1 John chapter 3, verse 5, it says, You know that he appeared in order to take away sins, and in him there is no sin. Jesus lived a sinless life. We were expected to live sinless, but because of the fall of man, sin has entered into humanity, and Jesus came to show us what it was like to live a sinless life. He died the death that we should have died. That's important. He died the death that we deserve. In Isaiah chapter 53, verse 5 and 6, it says, He was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. Upon him was the chastisement that brought us peace. With his wounds we are healed. We are all like sheep have gone astray, and we have turned every one into his own way. And the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. Now, three days later, this is what we know of as Easter. Three days later, he rose from the dead, proving that he is the Son of God. Acts chapter 2, verse 24 says this, But God raised him from the dead, freeing him from the agony of death, because it was impossible for death to keep its hold on him any longer. So not only did he rise from the dead, proving that he is the Son of God, he offers the gift of salvation for all who repent and believe the gospel. See, it's through Jesus Christ that we can be saved from the divine judgment and wrath and eternal punishment that we all deserve. In Ephesians chapter 2, verses 3 through 5, it says, But we were by children, nature, children of wrath like the rest of mankind, but God, but God being rich in mercy because of his great love, which he loved us, even while we were dead in our trespasses, made us alive together with Christ. And by grace, you have been saved. That is so much some good news. And it says that we can be spiritually born again and experience new life 
in Christ. I just want to give you some, some good news right now in addition to that. It says in John chapter 3, verse 5 and 6, Truly, truly, I say to you, Jesus answered, Unless one is born of water and of the Spirit, he cannot enter the kingdom of God. That which is born of flesh is flesh, and that which is born of the Spirit is spirit. So again, what is the gospel? You're going to hear a lot at Restoration House about the gospel. We believe it is the answer for humanity. It is the answer for our community. It is the answer to the condition of the human heart. The gospel is the good news that God became man in Jesus Christ. He lived the life that we should have lived. He died the death that we should have died in our place. Three days later, he rose from the dead, proving that he is the Son of God, and he offers the gift of salvation for all who repent and believe the gospel. We said it before, that is good news. But what is our response to that good news? So the biblical response to the gospel is repentance, faith, and surrender. Repentance is literally when you turn around or turn away from sin and turn towards God. Acts chapter 3, verse 19 and 20 says, Repent, therefore, turn back, that your sins may be blotted out, that times of refreshing may come from the presence of the Lord. 2 Corinthians chapter 7, verse 10 says, For godly grief produces repentance that leads to salvation without regret, whereas worldly grief produces death. So what is faith? It takes faith to believe the gospel. It takes faith to believe the word of God. But what is faith? Saving faith in the gospel involves believing what the Bible teaches about Jesus Christ and putting your trust in him alone for salvation. John chapter 3 verse 16 says, For God so loved the world that he gave his only Son, and whoever believes, that's the big word there, whoever believes in him should not perish but have eternal life. Ephesians chapter 2 verse 8 and 9 says it like this, for by grace you have been saved through faith. Faith is what takes someone from not believing to believing and someone who is not saved to being saved. And this is not of your own doing. It is a gift of God. It is a gift of God, not a result of works so that no one may boast. So what does it mean to surrender to the Lordship of Jesus Christ? Savior is saving is what he does, but Lord is who Jesus is. Lord means that he is the boss. He's the master. He's the one who calls the shot. It means that he is the owner of everything. Surrender to the lordship of Jesus involves acknowledging Jesus's legitimate authority over your life. He is the king of kings. He is the Lord of lords. Submitting to him it is a decision to follow Jesus for the rest of your life as the Lord of your life. Nowhere in Scripture was there ever the option to be given to receive Jesus as Savior only. It has to be a package deal. You have to receive him as your Savior and as Lord. In Acts chapter 2, verse 36, it says, Let all the house of Israel therefore know for certain that God made him both, Lord and Christ, this Jesus whom you have crucified. So surrendering to the Lordship of Jesus Christ. First, it begins in the heart. It begins in the heart. First Peter chapter 3, verse 15 says, But in your hearts revere Christ as Lord. Second part of that is following Jesus as Lord means it demands obedience. It's not an option to follow him if he's your Lord. It demands obedience. Matthew chapter 7, verse 21 says, Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but only the one who does the will of my Father in heaven. Third thing is, it's a continuous walk. It begins in the heart. It demands obedience. And it's a continuous walk. Every day you wake up, Jesus Christ is Lord. In Colossians chapter 2, verse 6, it says, So then, just as you received Christ Jesus as Lord, 
continue to live your lives in him. It's an everyday walk. Now, the biblical pattern, once someone gave their life to Jesus, decided that he was Lord, that they started to follow him, the next step in that is water baptism. So we're going to talk briefly about water baptism. Who should be water baptized? God commands every follower of the Lord Jesus Christ to be water baptized. Matthew chapter 28, verses 18 through 20 says, Jesus came and said to them, all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I have commanded you. And behold, I am with you always, even unto the end of the age. So why should every believer be baptized? We're going to break that down for you. First reason is it is a fundamental act of obedience to the Lord Jesus Christ that signifies our submission to him. The apostle Peter refers to water baptism as a pledge of a good conscience towards God, meaning that it is a symbolic way of promising God to live in submission to him and his loving authority. Second thing, is it is the identification with Christ in his burial and in his resurrection. Romans chapter 6, verse 3 and 4 says, Did you not know that all of us who have been baptized in Christ Jesus were baptized into his death? We were buried, therefore, by him, by baptism, into death, in order that, just as Christ was raised from the dead, by the glory of the Father, we too may walk in the newness of of life. See, by obeying his command to be baptized, we identify with the power of the cross and the resurrection to deliver us from the power and the authority of sin. Third reason, it is associated with being cleansed of our sin. Acts chapter 22 verse 16 says, now why do you wait? Rise and be baptized and wash away your sins, calling on his name. So when should a believer be water baptized? Every person who has uh, repented and believed the gospel concerning the Lordship of Jesus Christ needs to be baptized as soon as possible. All the examples given in the New Testament clearly indicate that the people who repented and believed, they were baptized soon afterwards. Now, how should a believer be baptized? Well, every, baptized, every person who is baptized should be baptized by water immersion whenever possible. The original Greek word to baptize means to submerge. It's like the metaphor for a sinking ship or dipping a cup in a bowl of water. It means to be completely immersed. That's why we follow the same practice of being water baptized. Thanks so much for this first session in the